Oh, dear. Hello, this is Bill Kemp, but it's time for me to come into your living rooms once again. <coughs> well, don't just... Please, madam, don't just stand there and go and slip something on. <laughs> American Broadcasting Network presents another edition of the Bill Kemp Show with Benny Hole, Peter Hanley, the Noteworthies, and the music of Neil Hefty and his orchestra. I'm George Ansbro, and now here's our Bill, Bill Kemp. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, get that man. Thank you. How do you like the show so far, huh? Oh, I'm delighted to be with you once again, friends. I'm delighted to be here. I, audience. All right, audience. Okay, audience. Wait, hold on, hold on. Look, man, that's not our audience. What is this? Sound effects, man. Take it easy, boy. What are you doing? I'm sorry, but uh, I always check my instruments by tuning in on the beginning of the Robert Q. Lewis show, buddy. Oh, I see. <laughs> This guy's got to stop drinking Jergens lotion and softening his brain. Uh, as I was saying, friends, it's nice to be back with you once again, and many thanks for your lovely letters and cards. In uh, particularly, my thanks to uh, inmate number six four three one one nine in Sing Sing Prison. Uh, he listens regularly, apparently, and he wrote, and I'm quoting from his letter here. He says. I thoroughly enjoy your program. It's the best thing I've heard in eight months, three weeks, and six days. Isn't that touching? I like that kind of thing. Let's see now. We're going to get the whole gang on tap here for our uh, opening number. That means, of course, Betty Holt, Peter Hanley, the Noteworthies, and, of course, Neil Hefty in the orchestra, the ensemble, as they say in France. Here they are to sing Honeycomb. Take it. It's darn good life and kind of funny how the bee was made and the bee made honey and the honey bee looking for a home. Made of honeycomb Then they combed the world And they gathered all of the honeycomb Into one sweet fall And the honeycomb from a million trips Made my baby flip Honeycomb, won't you be my baby Honeycomb, be my own Just a hank of hair and a piece of bone Made of walking, talking honeycomb Honeycomb, won't you be my baby Honeycomb, be my own What a darn good life When I have a wife like honeycomb beginning indeed. Uh, the whole lot of us this morning, 10 o'clock this morning, we're over at the special screening rooms, private screening rooms at 20th Century Fox here in New York, and we saw a fantastically great movie called The Enemy Below. This whole thing takes place out on the sea, you see, and it concerns a, a battleship, a destroyer, and a submarine all on the sea. And it just reminded me of this, I, I think one of the most fabulous stories of all time, of this guy, he started out years and years ago as a cabin boy, you know, and he sort of as though the sea was in his blood. And he went to work, he was conscientious, he studied navigation and everything as a cabin boy, and he went on and on. Eventually he became, after a lot of conscientious work, he became, he attained the rank of first mate, and a number of more years passed, and finally he received his first command. He was made captain of his own ship, and he was an excellent man. I mean, the, uh, this incidentally, he was with the steamship lines, you know, a big line like the Canard Line. And uh, he was wonderful. I mean, he was a great man. The ship was spotlessly clean at all times, and the captain himself was going around, you know, with the braid, the uniform every morning. He had one little idiosyncrasy, though, that every morning he would go get up, up out of the bunk, 
go up onto the bridge, and he'd go into the bridge, and at one corner there, he had a little golden box, and it was, it was you know, nailed right into the wall, and it was locked, and he'd unlock it with a golden key, open a little drawer in there, look at a slip of paper for a moment, and he'd go, <laughs> yeah, and he'd put it back, and he'd lock it again. Every morning, this, this, they figured, well, the guy in idiosyncrasy, why? No problem. Well, eventually, as I say, he, became, he was captain, and then he was made the greatest accolade of all. He was made, uh, he was made commodore of the entire line. Many, many of the years had gone by. And then they had their biggest ship they'd ever made, the biggest ship on the Atlantic, and uh, on its maiden voyage, he was chosen, of course, as commodore of the line to head the ship. And out he went, and it was a tremendous thing, a lot of publicity and everything, and he still had that little, little idiosyncrasy. You know, every morning, he'd go up up there, and he'd open that little golden box with the golden key, pull out the drawer, and look at the piece of paper, and go, <laughs> yeah, and put it back, you see, and lock it again. Well, disaster struck. They struck a reef, and the ship went down. Fortunately, all the passengers were saved, except the Commodore himself. He went down with the ship. And although it was a dreadful disaster, the, uh, the steamship line's president decided that the man had been just too great all these years. So they sent divers down, and they managed to get that little golden box, remove it from the wall of the bridge, bring it up, and they brought it back here to New York. And in the presence of all the big officers and the, uh, the big brass of the steamship lines, they opened this little box to find out what it was. And in there, sure enough, was a little piece of paper, and on the paper was written, Port Left, Starboard Right. Ah! <laughs> well, <laughs> it took a long time, but, you know. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here's a song called The Twelfth of Never, and let's welcome Mr. Peter Hanley to sing it. Hmm? You ask how much I need you. Must I explain? I need you, oh my darling, like roses need rain. You ask how long I'll love you, I'll tell you true, until the twelfth of never, I'll still be loving you. Hold me close, never let me go, hold me close, melt my heart like April snow, I'll love you till the bluebells forget to bloom. I'll love you till the clover has lost its perfume. I'll love you till the poets run out of rhyme. Until the twelfth of never, and that's a long, long time. Yeah, we're cutting this little old thing here. Because what I tell the people, let them in on it on the air. We're just cutting a sketch here, but we're going to put in a little later. I think it's very funny. Of course, I'm biased. I wrote it. Yeah, da, da, da. Well, we still got the subway strike here and all the transit tie-up here in New York City. Of course, the buses are terribly crowded as a result of this transit tie-up. I was on a bus this afternoon, and an old, old woman came in, and her arms were loaded down with packages. And would you believe it? Nobody gave up, got up to give her a seat. I mean, I'm just, I just sat there amazed. It was a dreadful thing. Oh, I tell you, we're having, uh, no, I'm having a terrible time getting around now, you see, since this subway strike. I don't uh, have a car, and I lost my skate key about a week ago, and ooh, it's pretty tough.
song. See, that's a pretty thing. Gee, that is a nice one. It's very good. You know what I do a lot of times? I get a kick out of headlines in the papers. Just taking a headline, if you, if you were to look at it and forget about the story value, I think you'd get a similar bang out of it. Things like, now here's, here's a headline. Metropolitan Museum adds another wing. Gee, I don't know. I don't, they'll never get it off the ground. This is so foolish. Here's, here's another one here. Man leaves million dollars to woman who refused to marry him 30 years ago. That's what I call gratitude. You know that? <laughs> oh, what is another one here? I marked him down. Thief breaks into store and steals everything but two boxes of soap. Dirty crook. Uh, let's see what else they got here. Woman gives birth to twins in a bus. That's a sneaky way to get a seat, isn't it? Uh, let me see what else. Oh, they got some wild ones. Largest laundry in the world opens in New York tomorrow. Mayor Wagner yanks off first button. That's interesting. <laughs> Should have quit while I was ahead. Uh, you ready for the next number? All righty, fine. Scenery's all ready? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here then are the note for these to sing, I'll never say never again again. <laughs> tell you, these, um, these two taxis banged into each other right in the middle of Times Square. One of the drivers hollered at the other. He said, what's the matter? Are you blind? And the other guy says, what do you mean blind? I hit you, didn't I? <laughs> Don't go away, friends. We'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> this is Jim Amici. You've all heard of reaction time. To a baseball player, a tennis player, or the driver of an automobile, his reaction time plays an important part in his performance. The time it takes a driver of a vehicle to react to a sudden change in the driving situations is his reaction time. The average driver takes three quarters of a second to start applying the brakes after dangers become apparent. At 50 miles per hour, the car will travel 55 feet before the brakes are applied. Then it takes another 133 feet to come to a stop. That's a total of 188 feet or 10 car lengths. If something or someone gets in the way before you travel that 188 feet, it's just too bad. Result, one accident, perhaps one or more deaths. So remember, safety check your car and double check your driving. <laughs> Welcome back to our little epic. This is Kemp calling again. Hello. What do you mean, my number, please? 
You said you were calling again. What number do you want? Oh, for heaven's sakes. Guy can't even use a figure of speech around here without being taken up on it. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> uh, from time to time on our little gem... No, save the applause. We'll need it later, actually. Uh... Uh, on our little jam of a show here, uh, we allot a certain period uh, for announcements of public interest from the headquarters of our civic government. At this time, we're pleased to donate our time to the Honorable Chester Fentress. Here is Commissioner of Gas Mains, Mr. Fentress, speaking from City Hall. Hello, citizens. I have just been investigating our gas main system within the past hour. I personally descended into the gas mains on Main Street, and, uh, and, uh, I, uh, uh... Hello, Fire Department. Could you please send an oxygen tank to City Hall at once? <laughs> Thank you very much. And this concludes the address of our uh, friend, the Honorable Chester Fentress, Commissioner of Gas Mains. And now we'd like you to meet the Honorable Peter Hanley as he sings Even When You're Not With Me. All right? <laughs> today? Mm-hmm. See, I'm a little, uh, I just poop. You know, I swear, I thought of taking out one girl after another, day after day. It's just revolting to me. I'll be so happy when I get had enough of it. I, uh, <laughs> see, you kids tried this, this Metropole restaurant across the street? Any of you eaten in there? Quite a spot there. It's, uh, well, it's a very, uh, high-class place. I got ketchup on the table and everything, you know. Big deal. I had something they called deep dish clam chowder. That means they deep the clam in once before they serve it to you. <laughs> well, they have really excellent... I shouldn't say bad things. they got excellent dishes there. Mind you, the food on top's pretty terrible, but the dishes are wild. You'll like them. <laughs> the only place where the food's bad enough that the mice eat out, I understand. I don't know. I shouldn't run them down like that. Now, let's see. Oh, don't forget, uh, a little later, i got to uh, tell you this uh, story of a uh, cow. You know, this cow that got a divorce. Uh, somebody gave her a bum steer. I'll tell you about it later. Right now, we want you to meet... <laughs> <laughs> now we want you to meet Betty Holder. She sings Chances Are. Betty? Chances are you think my heart 
Goodbye. Oh, and she's a doll. Trouble with this life. There are so many women and so little time. Oh, uh, <clears throat> speaking of time, last week at approximately the same time, we uh, delivered ourselves of a dramatic thing entitled The Orient Express. Now, that little dramatic nugget was our answer to the English series of murder mysteries which inevitably occur either on the Orient Express or on various English trains. And the response, and I'm not kidding you, was terrific. For instance, we had a cable from the Right Honorable Ivan Forsyth of Kensington News, Warwickshire, Pimlico on Thames, England. He wired us and he said, What who? And uh, we, also had, uh, we also had another message. This, uh, another one from England, a letter from Keswick Strudley. He's a barrister of Chibi Manor in Griswold, Fermé le Penetre, a little bit this side of Thames in Shropshire, England. He wrote, Good show, carry on. And so... <laughs> Oh, boy, you've been drinking between drinks again. <laughs> well, to follow up last week's triumph, we present today another English drama. Will you explain it, please, George? Happily. Those of you... <laughs> Those of you who are old enough to remember back five, six, or seven years will recall an English-produced motion picture entitled The 39 Steps. Tonight, we're proud to present our own version of this type of mystery, entitled The 40 Steps. Yes, we're delighted to present... The 40 Steps. Ladies and gentlemen, that was our production, The Forty Steps. <laughs> talented musician by the name of Lou Stein at the piano, playing his own composition, Soft Sands. Here's Lou. this jockey here in New York. He'd say, hey, I got a great record. You see, he couldn't afford to have a guy plugging him, you see. So he used to go around himself and, and peddle these records. They were great, boy. Just great. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we pause just for a moment of silent tribute to salute the window cleaners of America, those poor frustrated souls who are always on the outside looking in. Oh, and before we get to this next number, very quickly, I saw a, uh, a movie last night on TV. I want you to keep your eyes peeled for an actress who was in this. I think she's going to be something tremendous. Remember the name. She's sensational. Pearl White. Very good. Now, here are the noteworthies with a thing that's doing very well these days, a song called uh, Sauce Dorothy L'Amour. I don't know. When suddenly you sight someone for whom you yearn, Sauce 
facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.